Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to another video on the channel and today we have got another iceberg one series that you guys absolutely love we have done two already if you are new the darkest football iceberg number one and number two and of course if you are not aware of the iceberg series on youtube that has been about for a while now basically on the top of the iceberg are the most known and tame events in football and the deeper and darker you go more unknown and a lot more sinister so as it is a premier league most stories in here should be relatively known ish it should get more unknown but it will also get very much more sinister as well tell me down below in comments your craziest premier league story and maybe some stories that i've missed out if you're new here please do subscribe thank you all for 330,000 subscribers and let's try to hit 3,000 likes you absolute heroes and let's get straight into it hi there i hope you're doing well no this is not a sponsored clip don't click off immediately this is me just simply putting forward my Patreon that I have launched just recently. In the last couple of weeks and months, you guys have offered unbelievable support. And I feel like we are building a fantastic community here. And I've had a few comments from you guys from my YouTube comments or my Instagram DMs saying that would I be open to setting up a Patreon? Would that be something that I would be interested in? Beforehand, this never came to mind. When I am live on Twitch.tv and I receive donations, I always feel like feel guilty because I don't feel like I give them any sort of anything worthwhile after that donation. I understand that some people may like my content or like me as a person and would like to support me and that means the absolute world. But to those people that felt like they wanted to not just help me but also become part of a community as well, I wanted to give that option. So that is why I have launched this Patreon account. The link is at the top of the description if you're interested. Absolutely no pressure to go and check it out at all. I have formed a Discord community as well, which you guys can get involved in my content directly in terms of giving me advice and just can talk about football or FPL or so rare. There's a few bonuses as an appreciation to you guys. Your name will be in every single video that I post. And by this, it gives me as a father with a, you know, with a wife and a daughter, it gives me a little bit less weight on my shoulders that I don't feel like I need to rush content for the sake of it just to get a video out early and I can put all my effort onto a video knowing that I've got the, the backing and I've got the security of a Patreon. Thank you for being here. Thank you for helping supporting me and what I want to do. High quality football essays and investigations. I really am so proud of my content recently. And thanks to you guys for watching them. You're, you're making it still continue. So with that said, link down below. And let's get into the iceberg. Thank you. The tip of the iceberg. Derby County 2008. In the 2007 or 08 season, Derby County, managed by Billy Davis and Paul Jewell, went on to experience the worst and most embarrassing Premier League season of all time. In a 38 game season, they suffered 29 losses, 8 draws, and 1 win. That's one win coming on a sixth game of the season, a 1-0 win at home to Newcastle United. If you're a Newcastle fan watching this, how shit must you be? Becoming the earliest aside that has been relegated in Premier League history by being relegated in late March. Their highest top goal scorer in this season was Kenny Miller with four goals in the league. There is no doubt in my mind that this will remain as the worst season in Premier League history. Steven Gerrard slip. After 24 years without the title coming back to Anfield, in the 2013-14 season, it finally looked like the year that Liverpool would go on to win the Premier League. Liverpool played Chelsea at home. The team coach each week was greeted by fans chanting, we're gonna win the league. Liverpool were only three wins away from winning the Premier League after previously beating Man City earlier in the month. Up faced a weakened Chelsea side in the middle of two Champions League semi-final legs. In that win to Manchester City, Steven Gerrard got the players together in a speech saying we do not let this slip. Well on this fateful day, things took an incredible turn. Just before half time, a pass came from Mamadou Sakho as it came to Steven Gerrard. For some reason, the ball slips underneath his foot allowing Demba Barr to run straight on through on goal and tucking it past Simon Mignolet to put Chelsea ahead. Liverpool went on to lose that game 2-0 to Chelsea, however they had another chance away at Crystal Palace. Liverpool was 3-0 up in a game away at Palace where the title 
at their mercy until a miraculous comeback made it 3-3 by an equaliser by Dwight Gale. This put it in the hands of Manchester City and Liverpool went on to lose that Premier League title. To this day, still one of the most incredible mistakes in Premier League history. Aguero versus QPR. I feel like I have to put this in here just because of the topic, but if you don't know this, then you must be very new to the sport or to the league, so I will help you out quickly. In the 2011-12 season, there was a massive title fight between Manchester United and Manchester City. Man City on charge to win potentially their first ever Premier League title. On the last day of the season, City had QPR, who was in a relegation fight at home, while United had Sunderland away. Everything was in the favour of Man City until suddenly they went 2-1 down at home to QPR in the last minutes of the game. Everything was set for Manchester City to win the league. However, going into the last minutes of the game, QPR was 2-1 up against the Horst and Man City needed a win to win the title. Despite a late goal by Edin Dzeko, time was slowly ticking down. Man United did their job and won at Sunderland and all eyes was on Manchester City. On the 93rd minute and 20th second, Sergio Guerrero scored the winner against QPR to win Manchester City the Premier League. Without a doubt, the most incredible end to a Premier League season in its history. Leicester 2016. In the 2015-16 season, we saw the most incredible season in Premier League history. Before the start of the year, Leicester City were at 5,000 to 1 odds to win the Premier League. This is due to them only just surviving in the Premier League the previous year. Leicester City went into the new season with manager Claudio Ranieri with all expectations to just survive again in the Premier League. But no one can anticipate what was about to come. With some shrewd business in the market with the likes of Riyad Mahrez and N'Golo Kante, with many others as well, Leicester City defied all odds and won the Premier League. I should do an entire video about this topic alone to give it its justice. However, I do not have the time in this video, but I urge you, even if you already remember, to just watch this season back because we may never see it ever again. Arsenal Invincibles. Potentially the most famous record in Premier League history. The only side in the Premier League to ever be invincible and that is Arsenal in a 2003 or 4 season. Arsenal won the Premier League winning 26 games, drawing twice and losing 0 times. With the likes of Thierry Henry scoring 30 goals in this season. An incredible achievement that still holds to this day in the Premier League and will very likely never be beaten ever again. I would love it if we beat them. On April 29th, 1996, Manchester United was in a title race with Newcastle United. With many managers wanting to keep a good reputation at the time, it is increasingly rare to see a outburst from one of the managers. But in one exception, Kevin Keegan is that outlier. Live on television in response to Sir Alex Ferguson claiming that teams try harder against Manchester United than Newcastle, who at the time Newcastle was letting a 12 point title lead slip. Kevin Keegan let rip, saying, I've kept really quiet, but I'll tell you something. He went down in my estimations when he said that. You can tell him now, we're still fighting for this title and he's got to go to Middlesbrough and get something. And I tell you, honestly, I would love it if they beat them, love it. Newcastle went on to draw their last two games of the year while Man United won theirs and United went on to take the title by four points. Let's be having you. Many of you may be aware of this clip of Norwich City's owner Delilah Smith seeing it at some stage in your life. However, many of you may not know the reasoning behind it. On February 28th, 2005, Manchester City came to Carroll Road. The Canaries were drawing 2-2 at half-time to Manchester City in a key game for the battle against relegation. At half-time, things took a turn for the strange as Delilah Smith got a microphone. In a somewhat mildly drunken state, she passionately said this. This is a message for possibly the best supporters in the world. We need a 12th man here. Where are you? Where are you? Let's be having you. Come on. Of course, that may not sound as wild, but if you watched a clip in the way that she said it, she clearly isn't completely sober, which makes it even more hilarious. And if you wanted to know, Robbie Fowler of Man City scored a last minute winner in the game for Norwich to lose. And later on that year, Norwich were relegated by one point. The Surface Kieran Gibbs red card. On March 22nd, 2014, the most 
baffling refereeing decisions took place. In a match between Chelsea and Arsenal for Arsene Wenger's 1000th game in charge. In a match that led to a 6-0 thrashing of Arsenal. You would have thought this would have took the headlines, but a refereeing clamour by Andre Mariner stole the headlines. With Arsenal already two goals down after seven minutes, Alex Oxlade-Chamberlain desperately used his hand to tip Eden Hazard's shot around the post on the line, conceding a penalty and a certain red card. However, unfortunately for Mariner, he thought it was Kieran Gibbs that made the handball and showed the red card to the wrong man. Kieran Gibbs were understandably furious and confused, with Oxlade Chamberlain pleading to the referee that it was him and begged that Kieran Gibbs would be rescinded. However, by the rules, the decision was final and the left back made his way down the tunnel. This has to be one of the most embarrassing errors in refereeing history, especially at the top level. Adebayor celebration. In the year 2009, Emmanuel Adebayor transferred from Arsenal to Manchester City. Despite playing for Arsenal, Adebayor publicly discloses his hatred for the club after the way that he was treated, describing Arsene Wenger as a fake manager. Adebayor claimed that in a meeting between him and Arsene Wenger in his office, Arsene Wenger told him that he didn't see a future at Arsenal anymore for Emmanuel Adebayor. Adebayor had no choice but to join Manchester City. Allegedly, Arsene Wenger had a press conference the day after his signing for Manchester City, stating that Adebayor left because he wanted the money. Adebayor did not appreciate that, so when he scored against Arsenal in the 80th minute, he did the most incredible celebration, sprinting as fast as he could to the other end of his ground and no one was going to stop him. The former Arsenal man ran the length of the pitch to slide on his knees in front of the away section. Coins, lighters and even a plastic stool rained down on the pitch from the away end. Adebayor practically set off a riot. Pizza Gate. October 24th, 2004 and Manchester United of playing Arsenal. In this era of Premier League history, Arsenal v United was always a fierce contest. United have just ended Arsenal's 48 match unbeaten league run with a 2 0 win at Old Trafford, and tempers flared while the teams made their way back down to the tunnel to the dressing rooms. The words, you cheats, were heard after Wayne Rooney won a late penalty under little contact. Arsene Wenger and Sir Alex Ferguson were said to be furiously arguing in the middle of the mass row when food from a dressing room buffet was thrown including soup and sandwiches but the best shot came with a slice of pizza. An unknown player who years later was identified to be Cesc Fabregas managed to hit Sir Alex in the face with a slice of pizza. The slapping sound of Ferguson's face was said to stop the entire fight as the slice rode down to his suit. Later, Wenger was fined £15,000 for his claim that Van Nistelrooy cheated. The idea of a pizza slapping someone's face is still quite funny. Darren Bent Beach Ball Many fans pride themselves on being the 12th man. On October 17th, 2009, one Liverpool supporter effectively scored an own goal against his own side. In a match between Sunderland and Liverpool at the Stadium of Light, a Liverpool supporter threw a Liverpool beach ball on the pitch. Inflatables were being thrown from the away end and one found their way onto the pitch and Sunderland striker Darren Bent latched onto a loose ball on the edge of Pepe Reina's penalty area and it rolled along the turf seemingly straight towards the palms of Pepe Reina but it cannoned off a beach ball which proudly showcased the Liverpool crest, changed direction of the ball dramatically and flew past Pepe Reina into the net. The fan that was found to be at fault was a 16 year old called Callum Campbell who allegedly received death threats from this event. By the letter of the law, this probably should have been cancelled out, however, it stayed and Liverpool went on to lose that game. Odom Wingy, Deadline Day In the January transfer window of 2013, on Deadline Day, Peter Odom Wingy of West Brom thought he secured a late switch to QPR and drove all the way to London to complete the deal. While arriving at the gates and being greeted by multiple camera crews, he was denied entrance into the stadium after both clubs maintained that a fee had not been agreed. Odom Wingy, who was left confused, insisted the deal that took him to QPR when he was told had been agreed, but was only told subsequently that his transfer was reliant based on if Junior Hoylet went to the Hawthorns. Junior Hoylet was part of the deal and he turned down a chance to join West Brom, leaving Odom Wingy in the cold. Odom Wingy was left in the cold by his agents and took a drive back up to the Midlands 
later in that evening after a transfer was refused. Lasagna Gate. As mentioned in the first Darkest Football Iceberg, I felt like I had to put this in here again to do it justice. In 2006, Tottenham were a point ahead of Arsenal to the final game of the season. They knew a win would see them qualify for the Champions League. They stayed at a London Marriott Hotel in Canary Wharf and overnight, 10 members of the squad informed the club doctor that they had endured an extremely rough night and many were violently sick. The players had eaten in a buffet dinner that evening and many of the players had said to have helped themselves to a lasagna. Many players were in a bad way, throwing up and barely being able to sleep. Michael Carrick wrote in his 2018 autobiography saying, I'd never endured agony like this. It felt like a fire was lit in my guts with petrol poured in it again and again. The game was not able to be postponed, but West Ham were happy to delay the game. Tottenham, who were clearly affected by their illness, lost that game 2-1. Arsenal that day beat Wigan 4-2, which meant that Arsenal qualified ahead of Spurs for the Champions League. Roy Keane versus Haaland. No, not that Haaland that you're thinking of. His father, Alf Haaland. Haaland was playing for Manchester City and in a Manchester derby, Roy Keane got one on Haaland. This was due to a grudge that Haaland made when playing for Leeds United, saying that Roy Keane faked an injury in 1997. At the time, it was 1-1 and Keane saw an opportunity to get one on Haaland. Alf came in for 50-50, winning the ball, but Roy Keane had no interest in the ball and smashed his studs into Haaland's knee, leaving him writhing on the floor in agony. In Keane's autobiography, he said, I'd waited long enough, I hit him hard, the ball was there, and I said, take that, you C-U-N-T, and don't ever stand over me sneering about fake injuries. A five-match ban and a £150,000 fine was handed out after an FA inquiry. Contrary to popular opinion, this was not a tackle that ended his career, but a wild moment of Premier League history that could have been so much worse, fueled by revenge and someone that desperately needed anger management. Kieran Dyer and Lee Bowyer fight. Very rarely do you see fights in football, and very rarely do you see fights between opposition teams, but very rarely do you see two players on the same team fight. In 2005, Newcastle United were 3-0 down at home to Aston Villa and with 10 men. With eight minutes to go, things couldn't get much worse. A pass between Boyer and Dyer was misplaced and Boyer told Dyer, you never passed to me and Dyer got the response, the reason I don't pass to you is because you're shit, basically. The pair locked horns and had to be dragged apart by teammates and Gareth Barry. The referee Barry Knight had no choice but to send both off and Newcastle were left to eight men, sporting a ripped shirt. It was later revealed that when Dyer and Boyer went back to the dressing room, the manager at the time, Graying Sooners, was so angry that he had an offer to both of them, saying, if you want to fight, I'll beat both of you. Both players apologised quickly in a press conference and they missed an FA Cup semi-final against Manchester United and Newcastle lost. The body. Cantona karate kick. In what was potentially the most shocking moment in Premier League history, on January 1995, Crystal Palace hosted Manchester United. And on this night, Eric Cantona, Manchester United's legendary player, ended up in a prison cell. The match was a ordinary 1-1 draw and Cantona had been sent off. He was dismissed for kicking out on Richard Shaw after losing his temper with a series of rough challenges. Cantona made his way to the tunnel until supporter Matthew Simmons rushed down to the front row at Selhurst Park. He taunted Cantona saying, off you go Cantona, it's an early bath for you. In court, Cantona claimed that there was a crude insult aimed at his mother. The United man lost all control, breaking away, jumping over the advertising boardings to aim a kung fu kick at supporter Simmons before following up a series of punches. After being pulled away by his teammates, Cantona eventually left the field, but everyone left the stadium astonished. The punishment was severe. The FA banned him for nine months, calling the attack a stain on our game. He lost France captaincy and was never selected for his country ever again and had a two-week jail sentence reduced to an appeal of 120 hours of community service. Years later, when Cantona was asked about his greatest moment in the game, he said, I have a lot of good moments, but the one I prefer is when I kicked the hooligan. 
and Nilka's anti-Semitic salute. In the 2013-14 season, in a match between West Ham and West Bromwich Albion, Nicholas Anelka scored two goals for West Brom and was celebrating his goals. For the untrained eye, it appeared like business as usual. However, news quickly filtered through that this wasn't so innocent, and instead Anelka was showing off the Quenelle, devised by a French comedian, the Udon Mbala Mbala, which had been viewed as anti-Semitic inverted Nazi salute. It was considered racially aggravated and carried a five match ban. Anelka maintained that he had done nothing wrong, but the FA disagreed, handing him a five game ban and fining him £80,000. However, the fallout did not end there, as West Brom sponsor Zoopla, a company with a Jewish owner, opted against renewing their sponsorship agreement before the club sacked Anelka, posting on Twitter that they would not continue their sponsorship with the club. Eduardo versus Birmingham City. In the 07 or 08 season, Arsenal was on a title charge and went to the Midlands to Birmingham to continue their form. Three minutes into this game, a horrific tackle took place. As to many people, they look back on as the worst injury they have ever seen on a football pitch. With less than three minutes gone at St Andrews, Birmingham City's defender Taylor flew in for a challenge on the Croatian striker Eduardo. As he flew in, Eduardo just nipped the ball away with his foot, leaving Taylor's studs to smash not into the ball, but into his leg, just above his ankle. I don't even know if I can show the photograph on this video, just in case if it does get demonetized. A replay of this tackle was never shown, and Taylor was shown a straight to red and received a free match ban despite calls from the FIFA president Sepp Blatter for that number to be increased. Arsene Wenger initially said that Taylor should never play football again. Taylor claiming that he visited Eduardo in hospital and that an apology was accepted. Eduardo, however, could not even remember his visit or even the tackle itself. Bonish salute. If you thought Emmanuel Adebayor's reaction to Arsenal was a little excessive, then you have seen nothing yet. This is an incident that I have never heard of and most likely you haven't either, unless if you are of a certain age. In a match between Tottenham Hotspur and Aston Villa, the Australian goalkeeper, Mark Bonish, took things to a sinister level. Tottenham fans at Whitehall Lane had been baiting the 24-year-old goalkeeper after a controversial incident two years previously with him and German star Jürgen Klinsmann. In response to the baiting by the fans, Bonish responded by raising one arm in a Nazi-style salute and used his other hand to display a makeshift moustache. Spurs, of course, have a famously strong Jewish following. The goalkeeper made a slightly unusual excuse by claiming that he was imitating a scene from 40 Towers and stressed that he did not intend to offend, claiming if it had been intentional, I should be in jail. Bonish got off lightly. His offence was not spotted by the referee and was later just fined £1,000 by the FA. Ryan Mason versus Chelsea. In the 2016-17 Premier League season, Hull City played as Stamford Bridge. Chelsea beat Hull 2-0, but the scoreline didn't matter. Hull City had a corner during their game, and when the ball was crossed in, Ryan Mason and Gary Cahill both competed for the ball, both leaping into the air for a header. When competing for the ball, Cahill missed it, and instead of hitting the ball, it led to a clash of heads with Ryan Mason on the floor for nine minutes straight. Ryan Mason from this incident sustained a fractured skull, leading to 14 metal plates in his skull with 28 screws holding them in place and 45 staples. Due to the location of where the contact took place, it was a very sensitive part of his skull. Ryan Mason could have very easily lost his life this night, as not only was his skull fractured, but had a very high potential for brain damage. 61 minutes after the collision took place, he was already being operated on at St. Mary's Hospital. This decision possibly saved his life, and sadly from this event, Ryan Mason had to retire from football indefinitely. David Bust Injury I remember being about nine years of age, and I remember seeing the image of this tackle when I was young, and since then, it has always stayed with me. In the 1995-96 season, Manchester United played against Coventry City. Coventry City was on the attack, 
and only two minutes into the game, David Bust collided with Dennis Irwin and Brian McClare. The scene from this event left Peter Schmeichel in the net on the verge of being physically sick on the football pitch. This collision broke his leg with the ball visible through his sock. The game was held for nine minutes and water and sand had to be used to remove the substantial amount of blood left on the grass. The injury was so bad that there was a possibility that Bust would have had to have his leg amputated. Fortunately, he avoided that fate, but such was the extent of it and the infection that followed led to him never playing professionally ever again. Potentially the worst injury I have ever seen. Ali Dia. It is often said that it pays to have friends in high places, but in Ali Dia's case, it was his cousin, allegedly George Weyer, who helped him to win a chance in the Premier League with Southampton. Southampton boss Graham Souness took a call from the former Ballon d'Or winner. George Weyer recommended the 30-year-old Senegal international, who played for the likes of Paris Saint-Germain. Souness took the opportunity and signed Dier up on an initial one-month contract. Two small problems. It wasn't George Weyer that rang him at all. And number two, Dier was a university student in Portsmouth. Ali Dia was named on the bench for a home game against Leeds United, and Dia shockingly made his Premier League debut, being subbed on for Matt Letizia, who was taken off injured 33 minutes into the game. After being subbed on in the 33rd minute, he was subbed off by the 52nd minute. Letizia claimed him to be Bambi on ice. Soon after, George Weyer confirmed that it was not him that called him, and had no idea who Ali Dia was. Southampton sacked him after 14 days into his contract. However, he did live the dream of becoming a Premier League player. The Darkness Fabrice Muramba In the 2011-2012 season, Bolton Wanderers played against Tottenham Hotspur at White Hart Lane. The game went on as normal, However, on the 43rd minute, Fabrice Miramba, the 23-year-old midfielder for Bolton Wanderers, collapsed. The stadium fell silent, and medical staff huddled around him, and the match was abandoned. Fabrice Miramba's heart stopped beating for 78 minutes. Miramba suffered a cardiac arrest in the middle of the football pitch. In what was perhaps the most public cardiac arrest in history, as well as one with the most miraculous ending. Maramba survived this event by incredible reaction from the medical team on the day. Their decisions saved his life after being shocked 15 times before his heart was restarted. Thankfully, Fabrice is still with us to this very day. Even though he may not be able to play football, he is alive. And that is the main thing. John Terry. John Terry, despite his obvious greatness on the football pitch as a centre-back in the Premier League, his controversial nature will always follow him and potentially exceed his legacy. One incident was between him and his England teammate Wayne Bridge. John Terry was found to be having an affair with Wayne Bridge's partner, who was also the mother of his child. John Terry had many disastrous stories in his career. One time, he was caught charging people £10,000 for tours around Chelsea's training ground. However, things got even worse for John Terry back in 2011. A match between Chelsea and Queen's Park Rangers took place at Lotfus Road. John Terry was accused by Anton Fernand to be racially abusing him. Accusations of John Terry calling Fernand a effing black C-U-N-T. In response to the video, Terry claimed that he was actually asking for the land, Oi Anton, do you think I called you a black C-U-N-T? John Terry was placed under police investigation. The FA stripped John Terry of his captaincy from the England national team. This went to court under the full case name of Regina versus John Terry, and by this trial, he was found not guilty. Louis Suarez. Luis Suarez is in a very similar camp with John Terry as a man who is definitely used to controversy. As one of the most strangest incidents in Premier League history between Chelsea and Liverpool on April 2013, Luis Suarez was found biting Chelsea defender 
Brenislav Ivanovic. A truly baffling event, from the images of him literally sinking his teeth into the arm of the defender. Luis Suarez went on to score an equaliser for Liverpool in the 97th minute. Plenty of fallout took place, with Suarez sending Ivanovic an apology, which he did not accept. Even the Prime Minister of the United Kingdom got involved and called for Suarez to be heavily punished. The FA took note and banned Luis Suarez for 10 matches. There was multiple other incidents for him in the Premier League. One time when playing against Fulham in December 2011, Suarez stuck his middle finger up at the fans, who was chanting cheat at him throughout the match, in which he received another one match ban and a £20,000 fine. But of course, his place on this list is due to the Patrice Evra incident. In the Liverpool Man United derby, Luis Suarez was accused by Patrice Evra for repeatedly making racist comments to him in Spanish. A two month investigation took place, and Suarez was found guilty and given a eight game ban by the FA. A day after he was found guilty of misconduct by using insulting words to Evra, including a reference to his skin colour, Liverpool wore Suarez 7 t shirts as they warmed up for the Premier League match against Wigan, a decision that the club is still to this day criticised for. Years later, Evra revealed that he received a personal apology from Liverpool over their handling on the Luis Suarez case. Later, when Luis Suarez came to Old Trafford to play against Manchester United, in pre-match, the teams shook hands and Luis Suarez opted to not shake Patrice Evra's hand. A wild saga in Premier League history. Adam Johnson. On the 24th of March, 2016, Adam Johnson put the league and a nation into embarrassment as he was sentenced to six years in prison after being found guilty of sexual activity with a child. Adam Johnson pled guilty to kissing and grooming a 15 year old girl. This was at his time at Sunderland and the girl in question was a massive Sunderland fan who was infatuated with Adam Johnson, who he was her hero. Evidence was found of 834 WhatsApp messages between the pair in just over a month. The most interesting part about this story is that despite being arrested on suspicion of having sexual activity with a 15 year old girl and was initially suspended, the suspension lasted for only two matches, who after Gus Poyet was sacked, Dick Advocate took place. Adam Johnson returned back to the club and played in a net to match. Despite Johnson being charged with three offences, Sunderland continued to select him while he initially pleaded not guilty to the charges. Adam Johnson continued to play for almost an entire year and his contract was terminated after he pled guilty to sexual activity with a child and grooming. Bradley Lowry. A young boy called Bradley was a Sunderland fan and in the season of 2016-17, his story captured the hearts of not just the Premier League, but the entire world. Bradley was diagnosed with an illness at just 18 months. That illness was neuroblastoma, and despite him beating the disease initially, it returned in July 2016, and the cancer was subsequently found to have become terminal. Bradley had a strong bond with the Sunderland striker, Jermaine Defoe. The duo first met on September 2016 when Sunderland hosted Everton in the Premier League. Bradley led his beloved Black Cats out onto the pitch as a mascot and received a round of applause during the fifth minute. Supporters of both clubs sang, There's only one, Bradley Lowry. Three months later, Bradley met the four once again as Sunderland played against Chelsea and he was introduced to many of the players and even scored on the pitch and won the official match of the day goal of the month. The entirety of football came together as players did their part to wish Bradley well. For example, Tridini gave a Christmas card to deliver for Bradley on behalf of the entire Watford squad. Multiple times, Jermaine Defoe and many teammates of Sunderland visited Bradley in hospital. Young Bradley fell asleep on his bed in the arms of the forward. Jermaine Defoe was called up to the England team. Bradley was so happy about hearing the news and as the players took out to Wembley, Jermaine Defoe carried Bradley out in his arms. Jermaine Defoe even went on to score in the 21st minute. However, sadly, on July 7th, 2017, Bradley Lowry lost his battle with neuroblastoma. Following Bradley's passing, Jermaine Defoe said, he was my best friend. He was genuine. 
He loved his football, he loved me, and I loved him. There was nothing I could give him apart from just being a friend. Since his passing, the Bradley Lowry Foundation has been formed and still continues to this day. The link to the foundation is down below in the description. The Abyss The Vichai Incident On the 27th of October 2018, Vichai's AW169 helicopter crashed outside the King Power Stadium shortly after taking off from the pitch. Vichai was the chairman of Leicester City who him and his son Ayawat purchased a club in 2010. With Vichai in charge, he transformed Leicester from a side in the championship and took them to the dream of winning the Premier League title in 2015-2016. From this event, Vichai gifted all 19 players a BMW i8 at £100,000 each as a gift for winning the title. From many stories from fans and players and managers, everyone had great respect of Vichai and the way that he represented not just himself, his family, but the football club. Vichai was on board with five other people who all lost their lives. On that aircraft was Vichai himself, his two members of staff, Cave Pun, Pornpair and Nusara Suknamai, British pilot Eric Swafner and his Polish girlfriend Isabella Rosa Lehovic. The cause of the tragic event was as the pilot turned the helicopter towards its en route heading, the tail rotor control linkage broke, sending the helicopter into an uncontrollable spin. One witness described the aircraft falling like a stone to the floor. As it struck the ground, it burst into flames. A rescue attempt was made, but sadly, it was too late. An horrific event in Premier League history. And his legacy, with his son still in charge of Leicester, still continues to this day, as heartfelt tributes was given when Leicester City won the FA Cup in 2021. Emiliano Sala. In the 2018-19 Premier League season, a tragic event took place between the transfer of Nantes from France and Cardiff City. This involved the transfer of Argentine striker Emiliano Sala. The aircraft was a Piper Malibu, and before the flight, both the pilot, David Ibbotson, and Sala had conversations with their family, describing the plane as dodgy. Sala himself saying, I am now on board a plane that looks like it's falling to pieces. If you do not have any more news in an hour and a half, I don't know if they need to send someone to find me. I am getting scared. David Ibbotson, who was the pilot, was not licensed to fly at the time of the crash or qualified to fly at night. David Henderson, who organized the flight and was originally scheduled to be the pilot, was charged with endangering the safety of an aircraft and was found guilty in 2021. The flight was arranged by football agent Willie McKay, who said that he was not involved in selecting the plane or the pilot. During the flight over the Channel Islands, radar lost contact of the aircraft. Ibbotson lost control of the aircraft while maneuvering to avoid a cloud and the tail fin and both parts of the wings broke away from the aircraft. The plane fell and crashed into the Channel Islands. After a search was launched on the 22nd of January, the body was finally found and recovered on the 7th of February. It was found early this year that Cardiff City, the day after his death, tried to take out 20 million pounds in insurance. To this day, the transfer between Nantes and Cardiff is still ongoing and the fee is still in dispute. Two people have lost their lives and the transfer is still in dispute now, an utter sham. The Hillsborough disaster. The Hillsborough disaster was a fatal human crush during a football match at Hillsborough Stadium in Sheffield on the 15th of April 1989. It occurred during an FA Cup semi-final between Liverpool and Nottingham Forest. Shortly before kickoff, in an attempt to ease overcrowding outside the entrance turnstiles, the police match commander, David Duckenfield, ordered exit gate C to be opened, leading to an influx of supporters entering the stadium. This resulted in overcrowding in the away end, 
and resulted in a crush with 97 deaths and 766 injuries, the highest toll in British sporting history. The disaster led to a number of safety improvements in the largest English football grounds, notably the elimination of fence standing terraces in favour of all seater stadiums in the top two tiers of English football was set immediately. The events that took place at Hillsborough that day changed English football for the better and fortunately a crush like this has not happened in English football ever since. Ladies and gentlemen, that is the Premier League iceberg. There are many more stories that I could have put in this video, but I didn't want this to be five hours long. I really do enjoy researching and bringing these videos to you. Some stories that I didn't actually know and some that I feel like is important to bring back up. If you did enjoy, then feel free and comment down below what is for you the most shocking story in Premier League history, as I'm sure there may be others that I may not have put in this video. If you are new, then please do subscribe. Your support is incredible. And let's try to hit 3,000 likes. And I hope you did enjoy, and I'll see you next time.